exploring the investment landscape with a guru's wisdom and a strategist insight. Good Life Companies presents The Market Enthusiast with Noah Brooks and Chris Needs. Welcome back to The Market Enthusiast. I'm Noah and with me, obviously, Chris Needs, as mm-hmm. always. I am so pumped this week. I cannot believe it. I'm, I'm one of those old-fashioned allocators. And we got small caps to the moon, right? Okay, maybe not to the moon, but we have we have it Feels working like it, though. We have it working like it hasn't worked in ages, mm-hmm. right? I mean, markets up for the year. S and P five hundred is up fourteen percent for the year, but small caps have just taken off since that last CPI report. And for year, I mean, it has been. I think it's been 2016 since small companies outperform large year to date. And you know, we may not get there this year, but it's like the first real bout of, of outperformance that we've seen in any reasonable time period. Prior to the CPI, S- I think uh, S&P 500 was up, I think, 16% over small caps on the year. Yeah. Now that's only 4%. Yeah. Year to date, market's up. 14 mid caps up a a little bit more than 11 small caps up nine but the the you know okay going back a little bit here when i first got invested i actually had uh one of the traditional stock brokers her name was Anne marie this is in the 90s and her she always used to pound the table the russell the muscles in the russell the muscles in the russell and that's what's happened over the last month um like I said, S and P six hundred up nine percent year to date. It was down going into this month, and so for the month of of July, and we're we're here uh, last week of the month for the month of July, small caps up ten and a half percent, and that's S and P six hundred. Uh, you know, depending on who you listen to or what news source you have, they might quote the Russell two thousand. That's actually up a little bit more than the S and P six hundred. Um, for all the nerds out there, the big difference between the Russell 2000 and S&P 600 or Russell indexes and S&P indexes is that uh, S&P, you have to have positive earnings for four months to get into. It's the one that we happen to use here at Good Life, but you know, they're both um, valid indexes out there. So yeah, I mean, things on fire since that CPI report, right? The rotation has definitely continued, no doubt about that. And it's not just small caps. I mean, we were talking about sort of the concentration our last few podcasts being an issue and you know it's actually gone to value as well so it, it's it's spreading out all over a lot of money coming out of large cap growth and it's really boosting breadth and and moving the market yeah there's no question about it so uh last time we were in here i think it was the 16th and the market was at an all-time high s p 500 i think it was uh 56 60 something like that we're down about 3% since then, um, which is, is nothing. But since then, large growth down, large value up. And the, this month, that difference is about 9%. So for the month, growth is down 4 and value's up 5 That's a massive infor- uh, outperformance or delta in, I think it's 20 trading days so far. Yeah. Since CPI, when I ran the stats, it was 12 training days. It was as of end of close last week. But uh, regional banks, who we all know sort of the struggles they've gone through a little bit, they were up 19% since CPI report. Home builders were up 14%. Obviously, those are more value-oriented stocks that are really pushing up value. Yeah. No, it's been great to see that rotation. I said I was pumped, and, and I, I really am. I mean, the last time that small caps outperformed was 2016. And as an allocator, you know, we, we recommend large, mid and small caps and depending on the clients, uh, some international, you know, emerging and, and developed, it's traditional asset allocation. And, you know, the last year or two, people have been coming up and going, well, why do we own these small caps? I mean, they, they still did wonderful last year up like 16%, but S&P 500 was up 26% in 2022. People say, well, why do I own this stuff? Well, there's going to be a time that outperforms. Well, when's it, when's it going to be? Well, <laughs> the answer is this month, people. This month it's going to outperform. Hopefully, we'll continue to outperform. Uh, in 2016, it did outperform by 10%, you know, year to date, or, mm-hmm. or excuse me, for the, for the calendar year. It's certainly possible. Um, from a standpoint of relative value, 
S&P 500 is expensive. S&P 500 growth or the Russell 1000 growth, it's expensive. So people are looking at the rotation and they're saying, you know, where can I find value in stocks that aren't those top seven companies or six companies? Mm -hmm. And they're doing in mid caps, they're doing in small caps. So great, great to see. Great to see. Uh, we got economic numbers to talk about. Yeah, we had jolts come out actually earlier today. Job opening labor turnover surveys. Yep, came in a little bit warmer. Um, 8.18 million job openings versus 8 million flat expected. So nothing that's going to, going to turn the Fed away from the path they're on, I would say, at this point. We don't think they're going to cut tomorrow, but you know anything can happen. But it, it's sort of the same sort of trends we've seen. Um, you know, quits haven't gone through the roof. They were at 3.3 million. Layoffs and discharges were at 1.5 million. Both of those are pretty much, we'll call them unchanged from previous reports. So nothing's really blowing up, at least in the economic data, uh, just slowing down, we'll say. Here you go. Well, it, it is summertime, right? I mean, so I think there's people that might want to go back to work after summer. It wouldn't surprise me to see people um, or to see the job numbers, you know, maybe perk up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, personally, I'm a summer guy, right? What am I doing at home? I, I'm watching the Olympics. I mean, could it be any better for the Summer Olympics? And I, I, I feel like there might be people out there that say yes, uh, <laughs> depending on on what you're watching. Did you did you have you watched any of the Olympics? I haven't seen much yet. It, it's not on purpose. Just you know, getting back from vacation and and things haven't lined up right. You know, but I intend to. There's, a, there's lots of events I I really yeah, want to see. I'm a sucker for that stuff. The men's gymnastics, the women's gym, well, you know, track and field gym gymnastics. I just, I think those people are so talented and they train their hearts out. I mean, the swimmers, everybody knows um, Ledecky and, mm -hmm. and, you know, some of the, some of the other names out Shout there. Shout out to Simone Biles. Yeah. She, they, she just won her eighth gold medal. The, the women's all around team won. Right. So, I, so yesterday we were watching uh, the men's all around and there's this guy, uh, uh, Fred, Fred Richards. He's on these bars and he's up there and he's planking himself with his arms out and you just see these muscles. It is incredible. So I know they're, the, the opening ceremonies. You can't do 70% of that. I, I don't know that I could. Everybody's been out of shape about the opening cer ceremonies. They, they stunk. Uh, my, that's my personal opinion. I think they were created in a uh, time of COVID. So maybe they were expecting it to be COVID and, I think there was some, I don't know, it wasn't, it wasn't great. Let's just put it that way. Uh, the boat parade, people that they had, um, some slightly of the other controversial. stuff. Slightly controversial. But I, I employ people, do not let that stop you from supporting our athletes. They train for years and years and years. I mean, they give up everything to go there and to perform. And it's just, for, for me, uh, it's amazing to watch those, those athletes because, like I said, I could probably do most of it if I really tried. <laughs> okay, I don't know that I could. Uh, it's, it's a great time, though. I think after summer, more people will start to look for a job. That's fair. I think? mean, the biggest job openings sort of piece you saw, um, Leisure, I think was like 120 plus jobs month over month. So a lot of people going to the beach. I know that firsthand. I swear, I go to OCMD every time and I say it's the busiest it's ever been. And, you know, if you're not out there at 5 a.m. putting your, like, beach tent out. Now you were just there. Yeah, you're, you're not getting anywhere near the ocean, which is so, crazy. Are you super far away from the water? Yeah, OCMD is just too packed. Like, if you're anywhere near, like, the high-rise, like, condos, there's just not enough room. I went to Nags Head earlier this year and it was like the closest people were like 10, 15 yards away and everybody had front row seats to the beach and that's much better. Not like that in Ocean City? No, far too many people. Economy's booming based on OCMD's <laughs> gauge, I'm telling you. That's great. Uh, speaking of the economy and a little bit of travel stuff, uh, every week you know, I subscribe to some airlines and um, airline industry stuff and every week there are airlines and don't get me wrong, there's airlines cutting routes, but there's airlines adding routes, um, net positive seat miles being filled. Uh, there's lots of stuff, lots of miles being filled out of the Philadelphia, the New York areas. 
some of them are going to Florida, right? A lot more people traveling to Florida, living in Florida, and there's definitely being added there. Um, Southwest had some major news for anybody that's a big Southwest flyer. Yeah. They're going to do away with the open seating, and you're actually going to be able to choose your seat. Now, are you a Southwest guy? Have you? I have traveled Southwest many times, but I sort of like the change back to more conventional means. I, I like know. knowing where I'm going to sit. Yeah, me too. Yeah. It's like, I don't have to like fight for a seat. You, you know, that seat is reserved for you. And... Yeah. I don't want to sit in the middle seat. Yeah. I would prefer not to. I'm not <laughs> saying I've never done it. I, I just don't want to. They also added uh, red eyes, apparently, and I didn't realize this, but they didn't have any red eyes in their entire fleet. So all of that. the uh, return trips, well, I don't know about return, but all of the flights from West Coast to East Coast, they were all at reasonable hours. Nothing that left late. So they're adding returns. They're adding. Uh, have they gotten their software issues straightened out that they had a couple <laughs> years ago? I know we have some new software issues. Oh, that came geez. Up. I don't know if anybody else out there or if anybody was uh, impacted by the CrowdStrike uh, meltdown that occurred two Fridays ago over the weekend. Um, but it impacted a lot of the software in airlines, uh, certainly in healthcare, healthcare banks, I heard dealers, municipalities, yeah. you know, financial services. Uh, so you, if you guys have any great stories about that, send them in here to the uh, market enthusiast at Good Life FA. But we weren't impacted too bad um, because all of our systems didn't work at all. <laughs> so it you know wasn't really that big of a deal was it i we thought we were going to get like an early weekend early start there and then uh, our systems came back on early afternoon so yeah. a little, little bit of, a little bit of downtime yeah a little, we could have some zen in our lives went mowed the lawn is that what you did yeah oh, geez <laughs> okay um so you mentioned the possibility i, I you might have mentioned the possibility of a rate cut tomorrow right so mm. what, what, what was it four percent five percent so the fed is meeting this week uh they're certainly meeting in september and what are, what are the stats that you have on on the fed meeting for september you think that 100 percent think... chance of cut <laughs> according to the fed watch tool um what were the odds for a 50 basis point cut though do you recall we were looking at that earlier i don't remember it was it was a decent percentage though but i mean 25 it's not a big deal, people. It's it's not the, the 25 basis points, even the 50 basis points. I don't know that it's going to make that much of a difference in the economy. It is certainly going to make a difference in the tone, right? And, and this is what they want to do is they want to broadcast it out. And they want people to know that it's going to get cheaper. Capital is going to get cheaper. Um, and maybe that's why they haven't done anything yet, because it doesn't matter if it's 25 basis points when they're it's not going to have a real impact with the exception of setting the tone messaging yeah, yeah. And, and the messaging uh, they'd have to do you know it's going to take 75 or 100 to really have any major impact and that won't happen for as we know that there's a there's a lag in there right that won't happen for six to nine months in the yeah. economy the market's expecting an end of 2025 uh, range of 350 to 375 right now. So, I mean, that would be very impactful at that, but we're far ways off from that. But, you know, the small caps and the banks and things like that, they can read through forward and, and plan accordingly if, if they're running off of that assumption and make ends work with financing and, and loans and things like that. Yeah. Well, everybody is expecting a rate cut, right? Um, I think everybody who's paying attention is. And that is impacting the bond market as well. So the 10-year yield, which is widely qu quoted throughout the industry, uh, was closer to 475 a few months ago um, in April into May. It uh, was 475. We're at 418 today, 4.2-ish. I mean, that's come down. The twos are close. Yeah. The, we're getting close to an uninversion. Yeah. The longest uninversion ever, or so, longest inversion Inversion, ever, right? So. End. For everybody paying attention out there, uh, short-term yields are yielding more than long-term yields, which is an inverted yield curve. And it's been a while since, since that's in play. It's been inverted for a while. Long time. Long time. I mean, more than a year. That, that doesn't normally happen that often. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about this, you know, historically speaking, after an inversion, there's some type of slowdown. Right. Some type of recession. 
is it going to happen this time? It's very possible. I, I don't know about a full-blown recession. It, it, we're in for a slowdown, though. There's a number of instances where it's uninverted and there's been no pain and the market's kept chugging along. And then there's other instances. Think of maybe December 2000 or June of 2007 where there was obviously lots of pain afterwards. Yeah. Um, but there's number of cases in each direction. So I don't think it's something you can reliably invest upon. And I, I will say this. Uh, it sounds so silly, but it is different this time. I mean, COVID, the, the way the whole COVID shock happened to the markets and to more specifically the economy, it has changed a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So all of those, well, it's happened 100% of this time. It's happened a hundred percent after this or before this or this way. I think some of that stuff just gets thrown out with COVID. Yeah, all the data has been totally thrown off. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of data, we have some interesting data that came out. We have uh, GDP that came out. We have some housing starts. You were talking about jolts that popped up this morning. Talk about GDP for a moment. So we had strong GDP, two point eight percent. That that's right? very strong. Um, I think it was higher than we were tracking a month ago, if you follow the Atlanta uh, GDP now function. Uh, but yeah, came in strong. Good growth. Housing starts were good. Housing starts were up. Um, we have housing that is becoming slightly more affordable. We've talked about it the last several times. Active listings are up to 19% year over year. Uh, you have the existing home supply that's out on the market is up to 4.1%. Um, that's much higher than recent history when there's been such low inventory and new home, uh, the new home supply is actually up to 9.3 months. So that's higher than historical standard even. So there's houses that are out there. So think about this. You have affordability rates, should come in a little bit as well. You have rates coming down, right? I just mentioned the 10 years coming down. The federal reserve is poised to lower. You have more inventory going on the market. How can that be bad? It's a recipe for inflation to come down further. It's also a recipe for GDP growth, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we know that residential housing makes up about 5% of the total GDP. And so if you have residential housing that's down 25%, that's, that could be a, a whole percentage point, if not more. One and a quarter percent of GDP is, is you know, by 25%. So new houses coming on. More people freeing up because mortgage rates are coming down oh, right now. I think they're still in the six, six, if I'm not mistaken. But rates are poised to come down. Mortgages are poised to come down. And we have more inventory on the market. Could be blowout numbers next quarter. Yeah. I, I, I hope so, right? Uh, speaking of numbers that aren't blowout, during the Olympics, they come on with these flash news things. They're talking about the park fire in California. I don't know if you've watched any of that. I've news. heard of it. I, I haven't seen much on it. It's one of the largest uh, fires in California history. It's, I think, 380,000 acres, wow. which is almost like 600 square miles. And it's only 14% contained or something like that. Is this also due to sort of like the El Nino effect that we talked about earlier impacting like Africa? Is uh, this... this is due to some guy trying to conceal a crime by lighting his car on fire and then rolling it off a cliff on You're fire. Kidding, I'm not, I'm not kidding oh you. Rolling it off a cliff and then that car catching the entire forest on fire. <laughs> did they catch the guy? They did catch the guy. Good. And he has three names. Oh, boy. Like a serial killer. Like an assassin. Like a, yeah, like an assassin. <laughs> it's kind of crazy how all those bad guys have three names, right? And they use all three of the names. I don't quite, I don't quite understand that. We talked about uh, software issues. Mm -hmm. um, we talked a little bit about CrowdStrike. So CrowdStrike is down dramatically. They were one of the top performers coming into prior to sort of that gaff, I guess we'll call it, that sort of yeah. brought so down. So what, what actually happened with, with CrowdStrike? What, what caused it? So obviously they're a cybersecurity firm. So they were doing, you know, just to patch their software saying out, you know, a new version standard procedure type stuff 
doing that in the middle of the software night. update. Yeah. So apparently it's part of their Falcon sensor cybersecurity. One of their most popular products had an Aaron line of code in there and it just caused mayhem because it shut down. Basically I know with Microsoft, it shut down like Microsoft and basically made everything inoperable. And that's sort of what we were dealing with for, what would you say, maybe a 12 hour period where like they're trying to get systems back up. So it was totally innocent. It wasn't a hack or something like that, at least that we're aware of at this point. But it's just crazy to think, like, if there was a malicious actor who had a hand in it, how easily things can be brought down. Or imagine if they had it shut down for three or five or seven days, the, the billions or even trillions in losses that would be caused. It reminds me of uh, Austin Powers. A billion dollars, right? <laughs> Do you know how much that they could get from us? From all of Microsoft's ecosystem alone? Yeah, they could go to everyone individually. They'd be rich. That would be crazy. But, you, you know, it makes you think, like, we're really beholden to, this was a, an update on uh, some type of Microsoft product, if I understand it correctly, and I, I'm not sure that I do. But, I mean, we are really beholden to the Internet. Even since I started in the industry, we used to use desktops, and everything was saved on your PC. Right. And now we, I mean, you have a PC or you have a laptop, but most everything's saved in the cloud somewhere. Yeah. And it just, it makes you think if, if you can't access the internet or if there is a malicious actor, a malicious state, cyber criminal, I don't, I mean, you take your pick and they're able to actually, you know, shut down the internet. I was reading, um, geez, I was reading about Iran having EMP bombs down. Or de trying to develop them, electro uh, magnetic pulse bombs. Yeah, I mean, you take out one of these big data centers. I don't know how much redundancy there is in the system. I would imagine there's a lot, but it could be bad. Yeah, I mean, especially if it's a state actor with a lot of money behind it. We talked about Stuxnet earlier and the effects that it had, and sort of was used against Iran. Uh, so, yeah, technology is certainly an area where we have to shore things up and make sure that infrastructure is, is in place. It doesn't seem like there's a real way to hedge against, against that. And certainly not from an investment perspective. I mean, you can hedge in your personal life. I know people buy, you know, physical silver, or physical gold, and you know, put it in their safe and things like that. But there's really no way to hedge it unless all you do is hedge. And that's your only goal is to hedge out some major black swan event. I mean, you can't really hedge against it in a, in a traditional portfolio because you're going to wind up losing incremental returns. The for point that of, yeah, the point of those things is they're, they're not predictable. So essentially, you'd just be losing premium hedging the whole time. And, you know, it's tough. It is tough. Uh, it's, it's tough for the people that are trying to fix it. It's tough for the users like us that are trying to, to, uh, to work. It's tough all the way around. But hopefully that's the last big one that we see uh, in the short term. I think it is. Okay. You can make that assumption. Yeah. What else we have economic wise? Um, what, outside of economics, oh I, wanna, I wanted to revert back to what you said uh -oh. last podcast about okay. the murder house. Okay. And if there were disclosures. There so. was for, for anybody who didn't listen, we have a house in our neighborhood. We call it the murder house affectionately, which there was. A murder there. If, if there is a way to affectionately refer to a house as a murder house. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's the murder house. All right. So I talked to my realtor friend, Amanda Vacher. She's uh, the owner of the Keller Williams up in Schoolhaven, up near my way. And she said in Pennsylvania, there is no legal requirement to disclose. There, I looked into it and saw, I think there's about eight states that require disclosure up front. And then a number of other states, I'll, I'll guess to say the majority, uh, basically require it upon explicit request, you know, maybe in writing or, you know, when you're showing the house or something like that. But Pennsylvania, there's no legal requirement. Maybe there's an ethical duty. I don't know. Uh, but no, there's no requirement. I wonder how many people wouldn't buy a house if they liked it. And then at the very end, they found out that there was a murder or something bad that happened in the house. I'm sure there is an impact. I, I actually asked Amanda about that, and she said 
what you'll find is if it's known to have had a murder in it, a lot of times it'll essentially go out or like sale. Like it will um, discount to the rest of the market, discount to the rest of the market, or even go to like a sheriff sale. If, oh. if you know, if it's out there long enough. So there's a higher percentage chance it won't sell based on that. Kind of depends on what the surround, like what how gruesome was it? Yeah. <laughs> right. So here we are, we're close to the end of the July and for the quarter, which is only July, there's only one sector that's down. You know what it is? What is it? Technology. Uh, right. Everything else is moving and grooving. Um, Financials are up 5%. Telecom's up 6% for the quarter. I mean, energy's flat, but tech's the only one in the red, and it's down almost almost 5%. Um, Mag7 is down 13% since that CPI report, so yeah. that, that checks out. So we talk about this rotation that's happening, and in, in our outlook, we said that we expect this to continue, and we certainly don't know how long it's going to continue. I think the real question on everybody's mind out there is like, okay, so technology is coming down a little bit. Those big guys, the NVIDIA's, the Microsoft's, the Amazon's, they're getting beat up a little bit. Is there going to be this ultimate buying opportunity or is this the start of something a little bit bigger? And just for the record, I'm going to say, I, I don't think we know that. We're, not cer we're certainly not suggesting that it's the start of something bigger, but there is a rotation that, that is happening out there that we, that we see, that we're witnessing, that we're feeling. And historically speaking, these types of rotations are really healthy. Mm -hmm. the, the type of markets that are unhealthy are the type of markets that we've had you know, earlier this year, where it's just a few stocks driving the returns of the market. And these these rotations into the broader markets, the smaller companies, the mid-sized companies, the value companies that certainly have not had any love, are a really healthy part of uh, of the stock market economy, if you will. And so we love to see that. That's why I said I was so pumped coming in here. We love to see that type of rotation. And so our positioning here is not that these stocks like NVIDIA and Microsoft and, and large tech, it's not the end of the world for them. It's just people need to take a little break on them. Yeah. We talked about how the concentration didn't build up in one month or two months. Um, so you'll likely see an unwind of that over concentration, we'll say, over several quarters. Yeah. And I mean, it's not like they're going to go from $3 trillion to a small cap. I mean, they're not. It's just that we need some time for them, for their earnings to catch up to the price movement that they've had over the last you know year two years mm -hmm. that's really what we need and that's a healthy sign in in the stock market really healthy i think that should be the takeaway from this is that this is a healthy rotation um not something that's going to end poorly yeah what else do we have anything good for the order well um we have that stegosaurus uh oh, ken man. griffin from citadel so bought a stegosaurus that's 11 feet tall, 27 feet long for, what was it, $44 million? Where do you buy one of those at, Chris? I have no is that, clue. Is that from like a eBay? museum? <laughs> you go on eBay, you buy a, buy a Stegosaurus? I don't know. I don't know where you get those. They're not showing up on my eBay. I mean, if you sort all of eBay from high to low, it might. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. But Ken Griffin, I mean, he's he's a big... In investor i call that an investment rather than you know just a you know a few money buy yeah well, what else has he bought <laughs> he bought the a first edition copy of the u.s constitution that was in 2021 i think that was for even more money um it was no, it was about the same amount. So that was for $43 million. The Constitution? The, the copy of the Constitution. He literally so, bought the Constitution? Yeah. Well, a first copy edition. So it's not the actual Constitution, but it's like one of the original remakes. I guess maybe they sent it out around, you know, they didn't have the internet back then. They couldn't just upload it for everyone to see. So. Was it made on a printing press? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was it in Philadelphia? I don't know. Either way, he, he's shelling out lots of money for these really cool collector's items. What would you buy if you, uh, you know, if you had all the money in the world? I mean, my son Nolan would love for me to buy a Stegosaurus, you know, <laughs> or maybe a T-Rex, but uh, I don't know. 
some some sports artifacts sports artifact yeah, okay well you think about that for next time right. um here we are at the end of the program and i just want to say you know market's doing well the rotation is happening and once again everybody please don't bet against america especially now that the olympics are on right we have 558 athletes or 83 athletes and we're killing it so far although I'll just say this, Russia's not in it. I didn't realize that until the opening Olympics, until the opening of the Olympics. They're not in it this year. So I think it's going to be China and U.S., right? Most likely. Okay. Don't bet against America, anybody. Until next time, I'm Noah Brooks, and with me is Chris Needs. Thank you so much for spending the time today. Appreciate it. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision. Economic forecasts set forth may not develop as predicted, and there can be no guarantee that strategies promoted will be successful. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly.